coming up on Judrinder's crime stories. One man destroys the lives of two innocent women, leaving behind devastated families desperate for answers. We knew what he was capable of. He was a danger to the society. He was a danger to women. He would do it again. I was annoyed, angry, disbelief, robbed, cheated. Why did he have to kill my sister? She was only 51. And I've got to live with that. Family and neighbours say they're worried about his mental state. The criminal justice system in our country isn't just about punishing an offender. It's also designed to offer the possibility of rehabilitation. But challenging questions have to be asked if those who commit the worst offences should ever be entitled to release, or whether life should mean life. This is a case of Pearl Black and Janet Scott. During the mid-1980s, Pearl Black was a single parent bringing up a young daughter in Nottingham. Pearl had come from a large family and had strong relationships with her brother and sister, George and Mary. Me and Pearl were quite close. We were six years apart from each other. She loved to dance and go out, socialising with her friends, as well as having a... She had a young family. We had a close relationship, as sisters do as we got older. She was a good, good girl. You know, she had time for anybody. I remember Pearl always being out, um, going to Sol Northern Soul nights. Um, all of us used to sit here, and go to Northern Soul, do with all the friends. It was during a night out that Pearl was first introduced to Simon Mellers, the brother of one of her friends. She was introduced to Simon through um, the sister. You know, she kept pushing, always a nice lad, he's this, that and the other. And that's how she ended up with Simon. Pearl's chance meeting with Simon Mellers developed into something very quickly, and they became an item. They got into a relationship, and then he moved in. Within weeks, Mellers and Pearl's life was entirely entwined. But not everybody was sure about her new boyfriend. There was something, always something about the man that never felt felt right. Uh, although it's my sister's boyfriend, he never felt comfortable in his presence. He would have this air of intelligence. He was an intelligent man, but he was very much a narcissist. And he thought he was better than everybody else, kind of attitude, you know? Within two years, Simon and Pearl had a daughter together. Those closest to Pearl, however, had serious concerns about Mella's attitude towards her. He was the sort of person that would be abusive towards women. He belittled Pearl a lot um, and talked down to women, but with men, he was nowhere near. He couldn't, he wasn't, he was a mouse. He was a very controlling and manipulative sort of person and thought about what he was doing. He tolerated him. And that's what I did, I tolerated it. Very quickly, things spiralled out of, you know, control with the relationship and it got very violent. It's so challenging being a family member and witnessing somebody that you love being harmed by another human being. You can see the manipulation, you can see the way that they isolate, you can see the way that they harm physically those people, and you kind of want to do something physically constructive to remove them, but you can't because it lies in the power of the person that they're seeing. So in this case, Pearl needed to take action, but her family were absolutely aware that this was a sinister relationship. When things started getting quite violent, she went to a refuge then that's when we noticed it was just out of control. He escalated his abuse to the point where, firstly, she didn't want to stay in the relationship, and secondly, she realised that she needed more than just breaking up with him. She needed some help, so she sought a restraining order. That gives you an idea of the temperament and violence that he was capable of. She had abductions put against him to keep away from the property. In 1993, an application for an injunction by Pearl said Simon was violent to her on a number of occasions. 
punching her in the face and on another occasion putting his hand over her face, stopping her breathing until she screamed and fought him off. She stated that she was frightened that he would force his way back in and assault her again. Continually wearing her down, obviously saying things had changed, this, that and the other. She felt worthless, I think, and she allowed him to reroute himself into the asshole. You know, so he got back in. Simon wants to control Pearl, and the fact that she's now resisting that control and that she doesn't want to be in a relationship with him anymore, it makes him really angry because he doesn't have any power over her anymore. So the only way that he can have power over her now is to have physical dominion. And that's what he intends to do. He intends to have physical power over her because that's one area that he can control. Despite getting an injunction and Simon agreeing not to go to the property, he continued to attempt to force his way into Pearl's life. It carried on coming to the house. It'd make excuses to continue, and then it got to the point where my dad had to change locks on the property to keep him away, stop from entering. One particular incident of violence led to a shocking turn of events. At the time, he wasn't living with Pearl. He was living in his, his flat. He didn't have a key to, to come in. Pearl had locked all the doors. She'd gone to bed, and he was banging on the door. Um, she opened the window from upstairs, and he said, can I come in and sleep on the sofa? And she said, no. She said, you're not coming in tonight. I don't want you here. She says, the only thing I could suggest is you're going to sleep in the shed. And that's where the, there was a rabbit, pet rabbit. The next morning after he'd left, one of the children went to feed the pet rabbit, but it was dead in the cage. They dug a, a hole in the garden, and that same day, they buried it. Pearl began to get suspicious of Simon's behavior later on the day, come back very, you know, bit nervous. Then she, she said, I'm a bit suspicious of how the rabbit died. So she took, collected it in a box, took it down to the local PDSA. The rabbit had been beaten across there with a blunt instrument to had its neck broken. Confronted Simon. He didn't admit it to it straight away, but in over a couple of days, he actually turned around and said, yeah, I did, I killed the rabbit. Pearl managed to force Simon out and try to keep him at bay. She was in the very early stages of a relationship with another man and had started to get her life back on track. She found the strength from somewhere to get him out. And she kicked him out. And life returned to normal for her. You know, she got her confidence back. It's nice to see her pearl smiling again. Then came the news his mum had died. The news appeared to give Simon his opportunity to return to Pearl, looking for support. He came round crying, apparently, and asking to stay. And his younger, his daughter, help persuade Pearl to let him stay for a bit. They went out drinking to try and arrange um, a civil... They're still civil to each other. They went on a few pubs in Elkiston and then came back about 11 o'clock. They stayed up talking for a little while, then she went to bed. Because he had had a drink, she said he could sleep in the spare room. Early hours of the morning, I believe he'd been drinking downstairs. And that's when um, the tragic event out, uh, happened. I got a phone call from my mother about eight o'clock, seven, eight o'clock in the evening on the, I think it was the 5th of May, 1999, asking me if I'd seen Pearl. And I said, no, Mum, I've not seen her at all. I've, maybe she's gone to see a friend. Nine, ten o'clock, I got another call. Um, my mum again, really, really anxious, saying something's not right. Pearl never does this. She never, she would always call me if she was going to be late. I was woken up about one o'clock in, one, one thirty in the morning. And um, it was my, my oldest brother, Billy, his wife and his, her son at the door, um, and she come in crying. She said, I've got 
Mary, you need to sit down. I said, why? She said, it's Pearl. Uh, the police have just found her dead at the house, up in the bedroom. The attack that led to Pearl's death was tortuous. It was prolonged, it was violent and sustained that violence throughout. He uh, beat her 69 times with an iron bar. And when she hadn't died, he went outside into the backyard and into the shed, smoked one or two cigars. Then he linked cable ties together, you know, the ratchet ties, and went back into the bedroom and garroted over them. For most people, inflicting even momentary harm on somebody else is enough to stop us, as opposed to compulse you to do more. It was, it was horrendous. I just couldn't believe it, and immediately um, we knew it was Simon because of the way he was. And I, I was just, like, everything was taken away. Numb. I was just numb, I, you know? It was just... It was just... a void. It was a total void. Simon Mellis had gone on the run. He brutally murdered Pearl and left her family in a state of total devastation. He was dangerous and had to be found fast. Coming up, Pearl's family demand justice. He felt sorry for nobody apart from himself. He showed no remorse towards the family, no compassion at all. But even they could not foresee the tragedy that lay ahead. Thirty-six-year-old Pearl Black had been murdered by her partner Simon Mellers in May 1999. He'd attacked her in her bed and strangled her to death. The next morning, he had removed the door handle to her bedroom and taken their children to school. Mellers had disappeared. A police manhunt was on. The body of 36-year-old Pearl Black was found in the house on Ulam Lane at Bramcott in Nottingham in the early hours of this morning. The mother of two had suffered head injuries. Police want to speak to Pearl Black's common-law husband in connection with the death. He is Simon Mellers. Family and neighbours say they're worried about his mental state and police have taken the unusual step of naming him. Simon Mellers was on the run. Pearl's family were left picking up the pieces. The world seemed to carry on, but you are like in a bubble. And you look at the world, you think, how can you carry on? I had to go and identify a body as such. And that stays with me now, you know? The loss of Pearl was, it was enormous. Um, when they released the body, then we, we had a burial um, for Pearl. The funeral was, a, um, she had a great send off. She had, people loved her. And that church was chock-a-block. I hope I get half as many when I go, you know what I mean? She was well loved and well liked and well respected. Simon Mellers is 38, 5 foot 8, of slim build with fair hair. He was driving a blue grey Montego car. He was on the run for, I think, two or three days. It was an eagle eyed news agency that seen the newspaper and seen the picture of him and got the police there immediately and he was arrested. George and Mary were at court in December 1999. They needed to ensure there would be justice for their sister. Simon Mellors accepted he had killed Pearl. He claimed his depression at the time meant that his responsibility was diminished. Woe well, is me attitude. He just, he was all, he felt sorry for nobody apart from himself. There were several times during that jury where they had to be adjourned because they were either crying, because they saw the photos, or they had to go and be physically sick. He showed no remorse towards the family, no compassion at all. Simon Mellors was convicted of the murder of Pearl Black and sentenced to life imprisonment. 
Judge Hopkin recommended a minimum tariff of 14 years. The judge, he gave him the lowest possible tariff, which was 14 years. Will you find the defendant guilty? The sentence was nowhere near enough for what he did to Pearl. It's a horrific, brutal attack. We was expecting a, a lo much longer sentence. If I robbed a bank, I'd get 30 years. You know, the great train robbers got 30 years. But taking somebody's life only warrants 14 years. Despite the conviction and life sentence, Simon Mellor applied to the High Court for his sentence to be reviewed. A judge would now relook at the papers from the original trial, reviewing the trial judge's report, his further comments and psychiatric reports. Psychiatrists in the trial had agreed that Mellors was depressed at the time of the killing. They'd acknowledged the intense strain under which the relationship had been placed. And in his original report, the trial judge acknowledged evidence of Mellors' genuine remorse. Pearl's family almost had a sixth sense about Simon's personality and they feared pretty much from the day that he was sent to prison that he would somehow exploit and manipulate the system to make it on his terms and essentially in the end to gain freedom. The ironic thing, he was supposed to show remorse. Now, if I'd done something like that, if I was in remorse, I wouldn't ask for time back. A reduction in sentence, guess what he did? He asked for time back and he got two years back of, of the... Uh, a London panel of judges. In April 2008, Mellor's sentence was reviewed by the High Court. The court determined that Mellor's sentence should be reduced from 14 to 12 years. He would be free to apply for parole in 2011. That's what human life's worth now, 12 years. You know, the more brutal it is, you still get that 12 years. You know, you've destroyed an old family. I was annoyed, angry, disbelief, robbed, cheated of real justice, you know. George and Mary had submitted witness statements urging the courts to do all they could to keep Mellors behind bars. Devastated by the judge's decision, they focused on ensuring their strong views were considered by the parole board who would decide if Mellors was safe to be released. I had to pull out all the stops. I realised, you know, this man had manipulated the situation. He started to hatch his plan when he was on remand. And he was devious beyond belief, you know. Myself and my brother both wrote um, victim, victim statements to the parole board explaining we knew what Simon was like prior, what he was capable of. He was a danger to the society. He was a danger to women. He would do it again. Um, and we we both mentioned this. We both wrote that into the, into the victim statements that went out to the parole board. Um, and we felt completely that they were not taken seriously enough. The impact of trying to keep Mellors behind bars was wearing both George and Mary down. It's torn us apart from what, what he's done. We're not the people that we were before, obviously, so, you know. It affects your family. It's like getting a, not a pebble in a pond, little ripples. It's like getting a big rock and throwing it into a pot, and it displaces everything. And that's what happened with us. The family were particularly devastated by the fact that in giving the court's ruling, Mr Justice Pitchford had referred to Mellors as a man of good character to whom violent behaviour is foreign. How can you say that it's taking a human life in such a brutal way? You can't do anything more serious. You know what I mean? Despite George and Mary's letters and efforts to keep Simon behind bars, they were notified that after completing his 12 years, the parole board deemed Mellor safe for release. I was told by the probation service that I was not allowed to know where he was. I was not allowed to 
um, be told point blank where he was going to be living. Unaware of where Simon was and what he was doing, Pearl's family had to accept that there was nothing further they could do. Simon Mellors was out on license and would be monitored by the authorities. Sadly, though, this was not to be a story of remorse and rehabilitation. Coming up, Simon Mellor's resurfaces. When Simon Mellor gets out of prison, he will have one intention, and that is to find another vulnerable woman that he can use, exploit, and control. And he does that very quickly in finding Janet. I would have loved to have been wrong, but everything I st stipulated and put down came to pass. Simon Mellors had bludgeoned partner Pearl Black to death in 1999. Despite Pearl's family's protest, after completing his 12-year sentence, a parole board deemed him fit for release. When Simon Mellor gets out of prison, he will have one intention, and that is to find another vulnerable woman that he can use, exploit, and control. In March 2017, mum of six Janet Scott was going through a tough time. Her relationship with fourth husband Chris was on the rocks. She turned to her sister Sue for support. Janet was my youngest sister. Me and Janet grew up together. We didn't have a very good upbringing, so me and Janet just had each other. My name's Keith Thompson. Um, Janet was my sister-in-law. She had a good sense of humour. She had a lot of fun about her, you know. She spent most of her life looking for something that she didn't actually find, hence the four marriages. She didn't like to upset anybody. She just liked to get on in life, and she adored her children. She put them before herself. Sue had decided to try and cheer Janet up and took her out into town for a few drinks. When you are a predator by nature, you have a heat-seeking ability to literally notice vulnerability in other human beings. Now, vulnerability for most people is beautiful. It's what makes us connect, it's what makes us attach. But if you're a predator, it shows your weakness, it shows your vulnerability, and that means that you can prey on them. So compassion, kindness, forgiveness, understanding, they are all weak as far as a predator is concerned. Janet and her husband Chris's relationship had been complicated. When I first met Janet, we were online. I just fell in love with her and that was it. We had a breakups and that, but you know, life went on and we always found ourselves together. She proposed to me. She says, well, let's get married. Hang on, aren't I meant to be posing that question, you know? <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, is, it, it blew me off my feet. So we, we got engaged, and then uh, the following year, in the May, got married. She looked absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Sadly, a year later, the pair had split. This breakup hit both harder than previously. She was very upset about it. She got more and more depressed. She wanted to be back with Chris. We went to this um, pub where we knew the our 70s and 80s, because we liked to have a dance. Simon Mellors and Janet Scott's worlds were about to collide. He spoke to me first, and I won't repeat what I said. And then he started talking to Janet, and next minute they was dancing together, and Simon took his jacket off and chucked it at me, so I did no more than chuck his jacket back at him, and I walked off, and that's I'm going home now. Made a beeline for Janet, and Janet took the bait. It just caught tough when she was really down, I suppose. You know, I feeling lonely. It was her ex, Chris, that Janet called to pick her up from the pub that evening when she'd met Mellors. She got in the car, didn't say a lot, pulled up outside the house. Janet, I said to Janet, would you, do you want me to come in or whatever? And she says, no, I'll see you later and got out of the car and gone. 
And then I got a text from her saying, oh, I've met somebody. Um, I don't want to see any more. And she was seeing Zana Mellis. I spoke to Janet the next day, and she said the debt's changed phone numbers. I went, oh, right. I said, well, you know what? You need to be on your own. You need to think what you really want now. You've been married four times. You know, you need to be on your own. I knew, you know, she still loved Chris. Janet told me he's in a bad shape himself. We're there for each other. Simon's done some stuff and that uh, he, he wants to settle down. And then a couple of weeks later, she, she texted me out and says, a bit, I've had a bit of fallout with Simon. Um, I, want to be, I want to really see you. And we'll have a fantastic time. And she say, right, I'm going to text Simon. I'll say it's over. And then a week after, she'll be back with Simon again because every time she did this, Simon would turn the vice up a little bit. She says, I feel like he's smothering me, you know what I mean? And um, she says, but he just keeps turning up. I didn't like the man at all. It was like shaking hands with a damp rag. I don't, you know, it was, I never liked the man for the moment I seen him. And uh, there was just something wrong about him. Chris became suspicious when Janet told him she was going to Portugal to stay with one of Simon's friends. I said, I suppose Simon's going with you. And she said, no. He says he can't leave the country. I said, what? I says he can't leave the country. In the dark, Chris was unaware that Simon had shared his secret with Janet. He had told her that he was on licence after being convicted of the murder of Pearl and that he now had to visit a parole officer just what account he gave of the murder is unknown. Throughout the holiday, she was texting me, and she said, look, I don't care. I want to be with you. We're going to have a fresh start. Simon's out the window. I don't want to see him anymore. That's it. Job done. But by the time Janet got back, everything had changed. Got a text from Janet. I don't want to see you. I'm back with Simon. I'm thinking, what? One day you're saying one thing, next thing you've turned 180 degrees. You're playing me about. What's going on? Janet's behaviour was becoming more and more erratic. She chose to share what she'd learned about Simon's past with Sister Sue. She rung me out and she says, um, I've got something to tell you, are you sitting down? I said, what? She says, put this name in on Google. I went, why? And she says, just read it. Janet had told Sue about a press article reporting on Pearl Black's death and Simon being charged with her murder. I said, oh, my God. So what are you going to do then? She says, yeah, she says, I don't think there's no need to worry. I went, what? When Janet finds out about Simon's past, even though you would imagine that that would be horrifying, she imagines he's changed. Secondly, he'll paint a picture that he chooses, probably blame the victim, probably suggest that he's been betrayed, and even though that won't excuse his behaviour, it will give her enough reason to feel that he deserves a second chance. She didn't know the proper extent of it. My sister says to me, well, everybody deserves a second chance. Um, so that's why she's carried on seeing him. Because that's kind of how our society is built. That's even how the prison system is built. So all she's doing is what society is meant to do. She's giving him an honest chance at love. Susan was also reassured by the fact that Janet told her Simon was in regular contact with his probation officer. Janet told me he used to go to see the probation officer every Tuesday. Well, if he's doing that, he probably is OK. And. Janet told me the probation officer was coming round to see Janet. But within a few weeks, Janet was complaining about Simon again. She needed space and she couldn't get rid of him. He was there all the time. He was just playing on my sister's feelings. She got to say she didn't want to see him anymore. It was like saying to her, oh, well, you need to see me because I'm, like, suicidal. And it got to the stage where she got the keys off him. She didn't want to see him anymore. Janet temporarily managed to keep Simon away. But by Christmas 2017, he was back in the family home. Susan did say that uh, Janet was starting to get worried just before Christmas, although she spent it with Mella. Uh, she spent it with Mella because she didn't want 
asked him to spend Christmas on his own. He suckered her. She was a soft touch. She cooked dinner for him. And obviously, she put some pictures up on Facebook where them two looked dead happy. But I don't think she was. And she told him just after Christmas, that's it, enough is enough. From then, she was back with Chris. It came apparent that Simon was losing his grip because the more Janet was talking to me, the more she wanted to be with me. So he he started to turn up the volume, as it were, with his threats. He says, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill Janet. Janet's family were increasingly concerned about how Simon would react to being rejected by Janet. I was a bit worried about it, and um, Susan told me I wasn't to get involved or anything. Yet. Janet was a big girl, she'd look after herself. Janet eventually came clean to Chris about Simon's background. She told me about Simon and what he'd done to Pearl Black. The description of it was so disgusting, how somebody could do that to a woman. Chris and the family were concerned when they learned that Simon was following Janet near her workplace and home. Simon Mallows had followed her and he was on foot. I said, well, you've got to tell the police or you've got to tell his probation officer that he's harassing you. And he's, like, just sitting outside her house. And she said, I've texted his probation officer and told him, you know, I need him to leave me alone. Chris moved back into the family home to protect her and to rekindle their relationship. We were back on track. I love this woman. I'd do anything for her. Janet returns to the safety of her older relationship, going back to the man that she was married to. At this point, Simon is rageful and vengeful. How dare she deny him? How dare she reject him? And almost automatically carries out the same behaviour again. On the morning of the 29th of January 2018, Janet woke early and Chris joined her for breakfast before he left for work. But something was weird that day. Something was felt really surreal. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't something right, it wasn't right. See you later, Bob. Went to the front door and I saw that front door and something just said, don't go. Janet was sat on the sofa watching TV. I just knelt in front of her. I just grabbed her and just said, look, Janet, everything's going to be fine. You've got nothing to worry about. I'm always here for you. I love you. And I kissed her. I walked back to that door again. And he said, don't go. Something said, don't go. But I'm thinking, damn, I'm being stupid. Got my car, drove to work. Unbeknown to both Chris and Janet, Simon was watching the property and Chris's movements. Nothing had changed. All of those years in prison was just years in wait for his next victim. I was at work, I got a text of Susan ring me. And all, all I heard was Janet's dead. January 29th, half past two, Janet's dead. That's all I got. I just fell down. I just... alarmed my world. It had just been destroyed. Tell it was my world. <laughs> Simon Mellors took, it, took her away from me. Simon had somehow gained access into the address and stabbed Janet. Once again, we find ourselves in a situation where Janet endures a vicious, prolonged, sadistic attack. He 
he got her out down to the car. She started to panic, and uh, allegedly she saw a uniformed officer walking up the street. The car must have slowed down at a junction. She made a run for the PCSO. She manages to just escape and imagine that moment where she realizes that she's got a chance, where she realizes that this man may not be able to kill her. And ironically, there in front of her is somebody that she sees as somebody keeping the peace, somebody who's a justice keeper, you know, a police community officer. A Nottingham City Council community protection officer went to help him give first aid. Janet told him that she'd been stabbed and was bleeding. And that's where he made a beeline for him. He just drives into both of them. He has not been changed at all. In fact, one could argue he's grown even more dangerous because an innocent individual with no relationship to him, with no history with him, with no rejection of him, that person was almost killed as well. And he must have hit it at speed because it's like a double curb there, it's a high curb. And he jammed his car between the wall that Janet was sitting against and the tree. You can imagine what sort of an impact would do to a body like that. Janet was pronounced dead at the scene. The PCSO suffered serious injuries. Journalist Matt Jarram was covering the story. My name is Matt Jarram. I'm a reporter at the Nottingham Post. Uh, my area of specialism is crime. It's a day I, I certainly won't forget. Um, it was Monday, January the 29th. There was a lot of cordons in place, multiple ones, and it took in a large stretch of the street. There was a lot of police officers and a lot of people in white coats, which are forensic officers. Simon Mellers, we, we knew very little about. We just did an archive search of Simon Mellers name, and that's when it all, we came across unbelievable results that he'd actually killed before. Pearl Black, 36 of Bramkin. My niece almost says he's done it again. He says, who's doing what again? He says, Mellis is killed again. He's killed another woman. Coming up, Janet's family have to come to terms with her murder and learn the truth about Simon's past. Simon Mellis had murdered two women 20 years apart. After murdering Pearl Black in 1999 and serving 12 years, a parole board determined him safe to release on license. He met Janet Scott, but within a year of being in her life, he'd killed her by stabbing her and then running her over. Two families were now connected and they needed answers. Why did he have to kill my sister? She was only 51. And I've got to live with that. That somebody could do that to somebody else. It's like every day something's missing out my life. When Simon was released, um, my concern was that he would form another relationship with a woman. I would have tried my best to stop it because they was in real danger. And I knew this. I knew this. And the way she died was as horrific as Pearl. And the way he killed Janet, you know, they had to identify by DNA. But like a mirror of the vision of our pearl. And it was just another violent, violent death. It was needless. There was no reason for it. Pearl's family lay the blame on those responsible for releasing Mellors back into society. Janet was really failed by the system. As soon as Janet raised her concerns, he should have been taken straight back to prison. They shouldn't have let him out the first time, and my sister's paid the price. She has. The systematic failings that led to Janet dying and somebody else being very seriously injured, that has to be questioned. 
I managed to get hold of George, and here is a man that is riddled with guilt. He tried his hardest to ensure that Simon Mellors was not released from prison, that he believed that he would strike again and that he was a danger to women. And Simon managed to get out. He managed to form a relationship with Janet Scott, and now she's dead. And I think he holds a lot of guilt because he felt he could have stopped this from happening, but nobody listened to it. I managed to get hold of Janet's sister and brother-in-law, and it became very clear in talking to them that Janet Scott had been in contact with the probation service numerous times, warning them of Simon Mellor's behaviour. Simon Mellors was charged with the murder of Janet, an attempted murder of the community police officer, and was due to appear in court in March 2018. He was held in HMP Strangeways in Manchester whilst waiting for his trial. Mellors would never return to court. He took his own life in prison. He's cheated the system. Checkmate. Done. He's a chess player. He knew he wasn't going to get out again. He cut it light. He didn't even face trial for what he did. Because it's a cow's way out. He knew he had nowhere to go, but he robbed us of justice. He robbed us of that right we had to see justice done. He manipulated everything, even when he killed himself. He was in control. He, it was all about control with Miller. Nothing else. All about control. They're never able to sit and watch Simon Mellors on the stand explain what he's done and to watch the judge give him that whole life sentence that he deserves. On the fixed date where Mellors should have been in court, the sitting judge said that as a result of his previous murder conviction, Mellors would have received a whole life sentence. At the end of the 14-minute hearing, the murder file was marked, concluded. A Ministry of Justice review is underway to find out what can be done differently to avoid a similar tragedy. The Home Office has said that the review will not seek to lay blame, but will consider what happened and what could have been done differently. I've never come across a case that has caused so much devastation to families. And even though Simon Mellors is dead, these families now have to live with the consequences. And not only that, who's to blame? Is it the parole board that were warned that Simon Mellors would strike again when he came out of prison? Is it the probation service that, despite warnings by Janet, did not act and she died? And is it the prison service for allowing Simon Mellors to take his own life? The story isn't over. Pearl and Janet's family are calling for a new register to alert those getting into relationships with people who are being monitored by the probation service. We want to bring a new law into the British justice system to say any convicted murder that's been released from prison on licence or what or other is put on a register immediately, a bit like um, register for sex offenders or paedophiles. So they can come back with an educated decision and one built on the information you know, how they might be putting themselves in danger. And if they can make the decision, no, I don't want you in my life. And uh, I believe that this is a useful and a life-saving tool. I don't want no one else going through the pain and the suffering that we've been through with my sister and will go through for the rest of my life. I've lost the only love of my life and somebody I can't live without. It's very painful still today. I still... It's, you have to get, I have to get on with my life with my, for my own family, but she's there constantly. I remember, I, you know, you don't, you don't forget. Since 2014, there has been a domestic violence disclosure scheme that gives any member of the public the right to go to a police station and ask the police if their partner may pose a risk of harm to them. A member of the public can also make inquiries into the partner of a close friend or family member. The aim of the scheme is to help people make a more informed decision on whether to continue in a relationship. All that the two families now have 
is memories of their loved ones. I want Pearl to be remembered. She was uh, a loving mum, a loving sister, very caring, compassionate person. She's missed immensely. I've got quite a few pictures of my sister. I've got flowers in my garden, and that's just... I remember my sister. And I want Pearl and Janet to stand for something in our society and to protect others. A recent serious case review into Janet's death carried out by the Ministry of Justice found that the National Probation Service had failed to act on Janet's warnings. They accepted the report's recommendations and 16 more probation officers have been taken on at the Nottinghamshire Probation Service in the wake of Janet's death. The Ministry of Justice has